So welcome everybody to this ECSE drop-in session. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, if you uh, have any problems during the session, then please do write into the, the chat box in the corner and we'll keep an eye on that. Um, similarly, if you have any problems viewing the slides or, or any other problems or indeed any questions, then um, please just type them into the chat and we'll see what we can do to fix that. So you should all see um, a set of slides. You should see the first slide that says ECSE drop-in session. Um, if you can't see that, let me know. Um, so I don't know if it's telling you how many slides there are there. It says, I think it probably says, tells you that there's 19 slides, but don't worry, I'm not going through all of those. I'm only going through about the first four. Um, the rest are just there really in case anybody has any questions. So I'm just going to move on to the second slide along now. Um, there we go. Okay, so you should be seeing the overview slide now. Um, so I'm going to just give you a little bit of an overview of what the ECSE program is. So the ECSE program is basically to provide um, funding to the Archer user community to develop software in a sustainable manner. Um, so this is either codes that are presently running on Archer um, that you want to improve the performance of or add new functionality to, um, or for codes that you want to bring to Archer. Um, so the objectives really are um, to sustain key codes for the UK computational science community, so often codes that are maybe already on the system that lots of people use. Um, but also, as I said, it can be for, for codes that are new to Archer as well. Um, another objective is to facilitate the efficient use of Archer um, via enhanced code performance and functionality. So basically to, to use the, the facilities that we have um, more efficiently via um, improvements to the code. Um, and it's basically to offer a not-for-profit service that offers value to, for money to the HBC user community and beyond. So the, Archer, the, the um, intention really is to, uh, to spread the HBC skills um, uh, a bit further so that uh, it, it benefits the whole HBC community. Um, we're aiming to, to develop and sustain codes uh, for communities from new areas. So we are, we are looking for... Um, I'd say not just the well-established codes, but also people that want to bring codes to Archer uh, to build up communities. Um, and uh, we do set aside some person months for what we call uh, new communities, um, and we can answer questions on that if anybody has any questions later. Um, and we're particularly keen to support and encourage early career, um, career researchers. Um, okay, so I'm just moving on to the third slide which is entitled Embedded CSE, or ECSE. So just to give you uh, an idea of how the, the, the calls work, there are three regular calls per year. Um, we're currently on the seventh call, uh, which um, opened back in November and closes at 4 p.m. on Tuesday the 19th of January. Um, it's just worth a note that that deadline is strict. If you, if you try and submit after that, it just won't let you. So um, if you're thinking of putting in a proposal, please do make sure it's in before that time. Um, as you know, Two minutes later, it just won't work. Um, so uh, most projects are for between three and 12 months. Uh, in exceptional circumstances, um, it could be, could be smaller or could be larger. Um, you, you'd have to um, make a good justification for that, but the typically projects are between three and 12 months. I think the, the average at the moment is about nine months. Um, at least two further calls are planned after this one. So um, the ECSC 08 is call, um, opens in March and closes in May. ECSC 09 opens in August and closes in September. You can see the dates there. Um, we, it may be that there will be some calls after that. It depends a little bit on um, uh, future funding um, of Archer and also um, you know, whether, whether we have person months remaining. But uh, those two calls are confirmed. So um, if, you, if you really plan with that in mind. Uh, so in terms of uh, who this actually funds, um, we're looking, basically people are going to be, uh, we're looking for people who are going to be working on the, the, the actual codes that you want to make the improvements to. Um, that can either be staff located at the institution of the PI, um, or it could be uh, staff from a, a third party, um, so some, uh, some other institution, or it can be staff 
from um, here at the central, centralized CSE support team, um, or it can be some mixture of the above. Um, so you, you just basically you use the combination that works for you. So it may be that the PI has, let's say, a, a postdoc um, who's, who's been working, um, you know, is familiar with the code and you want to make improvements to it, that's fine. Or it may be that you want to ask us to make improvements to the code, um, that's fine. Or it may be that you want um, you know, your postdoc to do some work on it, but you need some support from us. So um, uh, you can use a combination. Um, so when we come to uh, assess the proposal, um, the ability of the technical staff uh, to actually complete the work is one of the things that's uh, assessed, and that's to, um, considered together with the, the PI and the, the COI's experience um, in terms of, sort of managing this kind of project, um, and also um, a, a training plan just to, to ensure that the technical staff have the, uh, the adequate skills. Um, so um, we're committed to providing an average of 14 FTEs per year for the ECSE. Um, but this is done in a not-for-profit manner. So um, we have a fixed budget of money uh, for the ECSE. Um, so we have to make sure that we provide at least 14 FTEs per year. But if we, if we find that we've provided them and we still have money left over, then the additional money gets put back into providing more person months. Um, so uh, we can make as good use of the money as possible. Okay, so this is basically the final slide I was going to give. Um, so you might sort of wonder what kind of projects that you uh, might be suitable for an ECSE, so just so we give some examples here. So um, one example might be the implementation of an al um, algorithmic improvements to an existing code. Um, so you might have something which has one particular solver in, for example, and you want to change to a more efficient solver. So that, that could be an example of that. Um, you may want to improve the scalability of software, so you may have something which already runs on Archer and scales up to um, maybe a few hundred cores, but you want to make it scale up to a few thousand cores and you have a way of doing that. Um, so that could be another example. Um, you might be making improvements to the functionality, so you might be wanting to um, make improvements to the code that actually allows new science to be carried out. Um, the, the, we, we don't actually fund the, the carrying out of that science. It's only really the improvements to the code which allows the new science. Um, that's what's funded here. Um, uh, another possibility may be um, you might be porting a code to Archer or you may be optimizing a code to run efficiently on Archer. Um, you may, uh, I guess I've already mentioned, adding new functionalities to existing codes. Um, or you may, be, you may have a code that um, presently runs on a tier two regional system, so say a university cluster, and you want to bring it up to, to tier one, to up to Archer level. Um, but as, as I mentioned before, funding can't be used for the actual scientific research itself. It's just really for um, working on the codes which, um, which will enable you to do your science. So that was all I was intending to give. Uh, I have some more slides in case anybody has questions. I, um, I might make use, we might make use of the slides here to, to help answer. But that was basically all I was going to give. Um, so really, it, it's open now for people just to ask questions. Um, there, are, there are three of us here. I didn't actually introduce us, so that was quite bad of me. Um, it's, um, I'm Chris Johnson here. Um, I've got uh, Lorna Smith and Jugar here from EPCC. Um, we're all. Um, here to answer any questions you have. So um, please just go ahead. You can either, um, if you put the talk on, um, you, can, you can actually talk to us and ask questions, or um, you can uh, just type into the chat. Um, we'll, we'll keep an eye on both. And uh, we uh, will do our best to answer the questions. Um, OK. OK. Okay, so we're just having a look at questions here. Just a second. Hi, so uh, this is Lorna here. I've got a question here from Alfonso asking, thanks a lot for the intro, Chris. Can the third parties be from abroad within the EU? So there is no restriction on where people come from. They could be from a university or um, an organization out with the EU 
um, if they're doing the technical work. The PI needs to come from within the UK, basically the same rules that apply to EPSRC grants or uh, NERC grants, for example. But the technical member staff can come from out with the EU. However, one of the goals of the ECSE programme is to um, develop uh, software skills with inside the UK. So to develop um, you, you know, the, the, the software skills. So if the individual isn't based in the UK developing software skills, then you're looking at things such as what happens to the software afterwards? Is there training for individuals who will be using the software with inside the UK? And of course, the benefit has to be for the UK science community. So I, I would keep that in mind. The other thing to say is travel budgets. We fund travel um, for the technical staff to visit um, you know, PIs and co-Is with inside the UK. We don't pay for travel out with the UK. So with those restrictions, uh, yes, the technical member staff can come from within the EU. Uh, does that, I think, answer to your question, Alfonso? Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, somebody's asked a question to explain a bit more about new communities. So, um, so I've actually put up a slide which I, I already had, um, which uh, you should be able to see now. So I'll, I'll go through that and then um, you, we can discuss it a bit further. So basically, as I said, funding is available for existing um, established communities on Archer, but what we call a new, a new scientific community is a community from a, from a scientific area not currently exploiting Archer. So um, basically, it's, it's likely to be, you likely to have a scientific need for Archer and uh, a need for greater computational power than you presently have access to. So, New codes to Archer are not necessarily from new scientific communities um, uh, because it may well be that you could join an existing established community. Um, so basically one, one of the things that you should probably do if, if you're not sure if you're from a new community is to look at the consortia that we have on Archer and there's a list of them on, uh, within the communities uh, section of the Archer website. Um, and look if it's possible to, to join one of those. Um, and if it is, then you're probably not from a new community. Um, if it isn't, then it may, be, it may be that you are. Um, but what you could do is, is get in touch with us and we can have a look through what you're doing and seeing whether we think this, this is a, an existing uh, uh, established community or not. Um, it's actually it's the panel who make the final decision on whether whether they believe that it is a new scientific community or not. But um, we can give some guidance. Um, so does that help answer your question, or um, do you want a bit more? Um, is there any anything more that you want from that? Are you on? No. Yes, on talk. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll take this question. There's a question here from George about software licenses. So there's no requirement for it to be open source. It, the software can be commercial. However, the bit that the panel look at is the benefit of the work to the Archer community. So the availability of the software to the Archer community. So if you're going to, for example, look to charge Archer users to use the software, then the, the panel will be looking to see how much that is and whether they feel it's a restriction on the availability. The work has to benefit the, the Archer community and software licenses that are too restrictive um, are regarded as, as a barrier to that. Um, but I wouldn't say, you know, we have software that has license requirements, that has the charges that have been funded and of course you know, there are, as long as it's a sensible model for maintaining the software, then the panel are reasonably supportive of that. Does that answer your question? Excellent, thank you. Can we do the next one? <laughs> um, 
Okay, so um, a question from Manuel who says, uh, unclear about the acronym FTE um, and we can find information about the actual amounts available per person month, etc. So um, by FTE we just mean full-time employees, or, um, so the equivalent of a full-time full equivalent. So um, basically, uh, so a one FTE um, for a year would just be basically somebody working full-time on the project for a year. Um, so that's that's so, so essentially just a, a, an FTE is essentially like a staff year. Um, so you're asking about information on the actual amounts available per person, month, etc. So what we did, the, the funding model that we use is um, we, we pay 80% um, FEC, so that's 80% full economic costing. So uh, most universities, most institutions um, use the FEC model. So what we do, what, what we ask is that you provide us with the costs um, uh, you, um, for for employing the, um, the person at 100% FEC, and we then pay 80% of that. Um, so we, we asked for those costs um, early on so that we can check that they're in line with what uh, you know, what we would expect, um, and then we can you know we discuss it if there's any problems. But it's basically we use the 80%, um, we pay 80% FEC essentially. And most universities are used to dealing with that. So although a lot of the um, not all of the PIs and um, certainly some of the, the, the staff may not be used to that model, the universities themselves are. So if you go to your institution and ask for your um, for the costing, um, for, for an FEC costing for um, a person for working on the project for whatever length of time you want, they, they should easily be able to give you that. Um, does that. Manuel, does that answer your question? I, I should point out as well that if, if you were using, for example, um, Archer staff, then you would not need to give this costing because um, we basically already have our own costs, so um, uh, so that that would not be needed. But um, if it's your if it's your own staff, then you would need to give us these costings. Um, so does that help? Okay, great. Thanks, Noah. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, a question there from Nick who's asking about um, how we define new science. So I think the, the important thing here really is that we are, we are funding code development here. So um, it, you couldn't use it for, for doing production runs or for basically um, you, you know, looking, looking at the results you get and, and doing post-processing analysis or anything like that. I mean, that's the key thing here really, that it is for um, the, the funding is all for working on the code and obviously testing it and so on. Um, so you could, if you had, if you wanted to take an algorithm from one domain and move it to another, that would that would be perfectly reasonable. Um, but if you wanted to then run that and do you know a, a whole series of um, production runs to to see what new results you got, then that that wouldn't be. So. Um, so that's the key thing really is that this is a funding development career. We'd expect that the person working on the on the project to be spending their time you know, working on the code, testing it, um, and so on. Do you want to add anything? No, I, I was just going to say with your example you say about implementing an existing algorithm um, or technique, uh, the word there is existing and so that would be absolutely fine. Um, what they don't want to fund as well is the actual designing the algorithm, the development of the new algorithm. But if it's taking an existing algorithm and then implementing it, that's absolutely fine. OK. Um. So, well, OK, so the next one. Um, yes, a postdoc can apply for funding. Um, and yes, you can use it to fund yourself. That's different, I understand, from the way EPSERT works. The one thing uh, you should do if you're a postdoc or someone on a fixed term contract is you should make sure that your institution is willing to support you. So they're willing to actually, you know, you'll still be employed by the university you work at. So you need to check that they're happy for you to continue to be employed there and to provide you with, you know, desk space and this sort of thing. Does that answer your question? Excellent.
this week. Okay, um, thanks. So George has a question about um, if we're optimizing a new algorithm, uh, sorry, optimizing code or putting in a new algorithm, um, would we expect this to include Archer staff um, time? Saying it's, it seems vital to have communication within the local team for how for hardware specifics. What share do you see? Ten uh, percent of Archer time. Ten uh, percent Archer staff. Nine percent of us, for example. So. Um, the answer to this is it really depends very much on the actual project. Um, I would say we would not generally expect um, to include Archer staff time. Um, the way what we would say is that basically, if if it's the amount of Archer staff time that you need is of the of the order of sort of you know a few days, a week, maybe even a couple of weeks, that would probably be the sort of thing that we would just handle as as support in the same way as we would handle it if you put in a, a, an in-depth query into the Archer help desk. But if it starts to get to the stage where um, uh, it was going to say take a month of our time or more, then we would probably want what we would want is to be explicitly named on on the proposal um, with you know, uh, in terms of number of staff months. Um, but certainly if, if you find that you, you need assistance for um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know help understanding the hardware and understanding Archer and just help with um, implementing things on Archer and that's at the level of, of a month or more, then you you should put that in um, and put this in uh, explicitly. But there's no hard and fast rule about whether it's say you know ten percent of us, ninety percent of you, or anything like that. It really depends a lot on the 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 actual project itself. But one of the things that is would be a good idea is. And once you've got a, a reasonable idea of what it is you want to do, if you get in touch with us, um, we can actually look at it and uh, probably give some guidance as to uh, as to how much of our effort we think it would take, um, and uh, maybe have a, a phone meeting or something to actually to iron out um, how much uh, you know how much effort from us you'd need and how much from you, so that we get the balance right. Um, and certainly, although it's not essential for people to have spoken to us before they name us on the proposal, it's certainly better to. And when it comes to the evaluation stage, it's a lot easier if you've spoken to us in advance. So probably the best thing to do is to, to give us a, an overview of your project, um, give an idea of what it is you want to do and the skills of the people involved, and then we can discuss the, the, the relevant breakdown, which you know might be 90, 10%, or it could be 100% zero, or it could be 50, 50, or whatever. Um, just depends a bit on the project. So, George, does that help? <coughs> okay, thanks. So, Alfonso has another question. Does the ECSE grant come associated with killer AUs in Archer? Yes, it does. What we do is we give um, 50, uh, 50, well, yeah, 50 killer, I'm just checking the details, yeah, 50 killer AUs per staff month awarded. Um, so basically, for, for every staff month you get awarded um, as part of the ECSE, um, uh, regardless of where that staffing comes from, you get 50 killer AUs. Now, what you can do is, if you if you find that if, if you think the project will need more than that, then um, you can request this uh, within the proposal, and there's a place for you to do that, and the panel we will consider that. Uh, they don't always award it, um, but uh, you know they will consider it. So you should ask there, but you do get um, the standard 50 killer AUs per staff month um, awarded by default, and you, you get a project set up with all that time put in at the start for, for, for you and all the staff to use. So to answer Thomas's question about how we provide um, funding to buy software to develop the, the code um, as a debugger, um, and whether funding for staff intern could be considered could be considered as staff. So to, to answer the first bit, um, we don't provide um, funds for buying software. Um, so you would either have to have that funding already, or um, the software would have to exist already on on Archer or you know, locally, or if it was if it was needed. When you say funding for staff and intern, um, so. Didn't, don't quite, didn't quite follow what you were asking there, funding for staff. I suppose the question is, what do you mean by an intern? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you could explain what the... Yeah, so, um, so Thomas, what, what were you meaning by, you say um, funding for staff 
an intern could be considered as staff. Um, I guess so. The question is here: what What do you really mean by an intern? Okay, so um, the the person working on the project uh, will need to be employed on the project. They'll need to be working on that project. So um, they can't. You can't be studying as a student, and the money can't be used to fund a studentship. I think is the best way to put it. So um, we have had situations. It is possible to be doing a part-time PhD, for example, and um, working on um, an ECSE, but the panel want to be very careful that they're not double funding something. So if you already have existing funding as a PhD uh, student, then they'll be looking very closely to see why they're being asked to fund more effort. Um, but I'm not sure, so are you talking about somebody coming, taking a break? If the student wants to take a break from their, uh, if it's a PhD, then um, that is a possibility. But, you know, generally they have to be an employee at your institution. I'm not sure if that really answers your question or not, Thomas. Thanks, okay, good. Uh, so Richard has asked about, does this grant affect applications for Archer time for production runs on the new code? So we don't fund any um, effort at uh, any time for production runs. Uh, it, the only influence it has is if you were to apply for something like the RAP panel, I would hope it would be viewed positively that you spent effort um, improving and optimizing the code. So it would just you know, in your application, you should just put down that uh, you know the code has been improved. But there's no particular; it's not going to restrict the number of wrap applications you can make or anything like that. Okay, great. Good. Thanks. So I mean, please do keep the questions coming if you've got any. Um, but I should add also that, of course, if you want to get in touch, then um, with any questions after the session is finished do please uh, just email into the Archer help desk um, and we'll get those answered as quickly as possible. But um, you know, if you've got questions now, please you know, keep them coming while, while we're here. Okay, so for, for those of you who are, uh, are leaving us, um, just thanks for coming along. Um, we'll stay online for um, a little while now if anybody has any any further questions. Oh, I can see this one just, uh, just come in. Um, but uh, yeah, do keep them coming. Um, but thanks to those of you who uh, who, are, who have come along. So Richard says, are details of previous grants available? Oh, I see. Sorry, yes, I, I see what you mean. Yes. So yes, this, there's a list of um, previous uh, successful ECSE projects. Uh, um, if you go to the Archer, if you go to the Archer website. The, all right. Yes. Um, so. Uh, Sue so is just uh, kind of going to type the link into, there we go. So if you look on the chat, you'll see the link there, and that gives a list of all the ECSE projects that um, have been funded up until, up until and including the, the sixth call. Okay, so uh, welcome to the, the person who's just joined us. Um, let's know if you have any questions. Um, um, what I've been telling people is to, uh, to either you can, you can, uh, to use your, your microphone and uh, use the audio to ask questions, or um, please just type them into the chat. If not, most people have been typing them into the, the chat so far, um, which seems to be working quite well. Um, so I'm just reading through another question from him from George. So, uh, George, with respect to your question, um, you're asking if we provide optimized linear system solvers. So, um, there, so there are, I mean, there are several that are optimized for Cray. So, I mean, there'll be things within um, the Cray LibSci library um, and also within the MKL Intel library 
that can be used uh, that are freely available for Archer users to to use. Um, and there'll be various other packages that, that are available. Um, so if you when you're releasing the work back, I mean because uh, primarily you'd be releasing it back on Archer if the software was available on Archer um, and and free to use on Archer that should be fine I, um, I can't um, I can't see that you'd have a problem with um, with the license in that respect um, yeah I mean obviously in the long term if you're thinking about how you were going to release it back to the community so that it could be used on other platforms you might have to think a bit about what would happen when the, the appropriate software was not available on a different system. Um, but I guess that would be a secondary thing. That the principal thing would be that on, on Archer, um, you could make use of the software we had there. I mean, to answer, to answer your question, Okay, thanks, George. That's great. So that's okay. Um, so Alfonso says, could you explain a bit more about the two-stage process deadline for the 19th of the first? Is that for technical reviews or for the final application? So the way it works is, um, so this is slightly different from how other um, funding works on Archer. So in most cases, if you're applying for the RAP or for a grant or for a leadership grant or something like that, then what you do is you get a technical evaluation done first, and then you submit that with your main proposal. Um, but that is different from what happens here. What happens here is that there, there isn't really a two-stage process. Basically, you submit your proposal, um, which is which has two parts to it. There's a proposal form, and then a, a more free-form, well, a more a word document that you you fill in, um, which describes a bit more about the proposal. But that's all submitted at the same time, um, and that has to be in by the 19th of the first. And and that is basically. That, that is you having submitted everything by that stage. So there's no, um, there's no other, um, you know, you don't have to get a technical evaluation done before that or anything. Um, and similarly, there's, there's not really a, a chance to, um, <coughs> to up, great, update your proposal after that point. Apart from that, once we have completed the technical evaluation um, in the, a couple of weeks um, after the 19th of January, we will then provide you with some feedback and, and some uh, multiple points, some questions. Um, if there's anything that's come up during our technical evaluation, um, or if we, we spot that there's something that we, we don't quite follow, um, then we will uh, contact you then and uh, give you a week to respond um, to, to, to make any clarifications that are necessary um, or to provide a, a piece of documentation if it's missing. So there's a chance that, that <coughs> at that stage, if we spot something that's missing, that you could uh, you could give us a bit more information. But um, uh, other than that, it's basically um, uh, uh, that that deadline is is the deadline to get everything in by. Um, so there's no there isn't really a two stage process in the way that there is for other Archer um, applications. Uh, does that help, Alfonso? So basically, make make sure that you've got everything. Everything in by the 19th um, uh, because that, that is essentially it. But there's, but there's no need to get a technical evaluation done before that. Okay, that's great. So I was going to pick up on the question. Um, if I understood correctly, a postdoc can apply to fund himself as this require, and this requires his institution to be oak with it. Yes, that's correct. Are there any additional requirements such as having a permanent co-I? Does the COI have to be from the same institution? So there are no uh, no other additional requirements. Um, you what you you know what you need to do is have uh, your institution signed up to host you. One way of doing this, for example, could be to provide a letter uh, just saying that they're willing to host you. You can have a COI if you want from the same institution that gives some evidence that uh, the department are willing to support you but there's no actual requirement. What happens is once the proposals have gone through the funding system and if you are successful then we will uh, set up a contract with your home institution uh, so it's at that point that you know if your institution isn't willing to support you that they could just refuse to 
to engage in the contract process, uh, that would be a waste of everybody's time, you know, uh, yours included. So I think the best thing to do is either a letter of support from your head of department, for example, or a COI from your institution uh, who can is willing to support you. Does that help? So I'm just looking at uh, a question here. Um, we'd like to know if it is possible to add more functionalities to the uh, to current available libraries as uh, ASC and extend that interface with other softwares like Crystal, as well as to make some set of benchmarks for specific materials that could help users to run more efficiently in Archer, Blast, Crystal, Quantum, Espresso. So certainly. Um, uh, Adding more functionalities um, and uh, creating an interface between um, different pieces of software is um, perfectly good uh, uh, work for ECSE. Um, so that would be that would be fine. Um, so to make some set of benchmarks. Um, so I think that would. Um, I'm just having a think about that. Um, I think it would de it would depend a bit on more on the details really as to whether that was um, whether that was coding or whether that was actually um, you know coming up with sort of input files and so on. Um, I don't know if anybody has yeah. has any thoughts here. Um, I I think it, it it's not completely out of scope, um, but it comes back to whether this is uh, at a a benchmark suite that would be beneficial to the entire Archer community. So to, you'd have to argue that it was beneficial to, for example, all the VAST users and not really a set of um, benchmarks that are really input files for you to do specific scientific studies. Uh, you, you know, I think the thing is to avoid trying to do science under the hood to try and get science done here rather than software implementation. So if you can argue that it's a benchmark suite that will be available to all the user users of the software and that the code developers will integrate it back into the main releases, then you know that, that would be within scope. So I, I suppose the question here with things like VASP and Crystal is anything that you develop, would it be um, released back with the VASP software? that we use for it. We're just reading your comment. Mm -hmm. So I think again it comes back to how broad a community could utilize this. Is it very specific to your area of science or will it be available to other people? Are you able to get letters of support from people out with your research group saying that they value this? And also are you able to get support from the main code developers to say that they would integrate it into the code um, suite? Does that, does that make sense? So the benchmarks are not completely out of scope, but uh, they have to be valuable to the Archer community. Okay. Um, okay. So I can I can go and ask. Um, uh, Wendy's question. So um, Wendy's asking um, uh, for some more information about supporting documents um, for the safe application. For example, is there any template for the letters of support or any other docu documents needed? Um, okay, so certainly the supporting documents, that's where you would put, for example, letters of support. Um, there, is no, there is no template for the letters of support. Um, so it's really uh, up to the person uh, writing it to uh, to uh, put that together. Um, I would say for the letters of support, um, it's important to be quite specific about um, 
you know, if somebody's writing a letter of support saying um, that uh, you know they're supportive of the project, that's all very well. But what we really want to see is people who um, you know you know, saying saying why they might use the the, the software um, and you know what it is that this will actually enable them to do. Um, so that's that's certainly uh, in terms of what 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 we'd like to see from a um, from a letter of support. But we don't have an actual template. Um, Another thing that might go in the supporting documents is, for example, um, the CV of uh, of the, the technical uh, the member of technical staff, and that's the sort of thing that you might put in the supporting documents. Um, they're the main two things that we we'd really expect to see um, in in supporting documents. Um, so they're the usual things. So is that okay, Wendy? Okay, so George, you asked about the Archer community. Could you describe exactly who this is? Would this refer to a group who technically <coughs> um, do grants or otherwise can get access to Archer or include a wider UK science audience? Well, I would say primarily um, we are talking here about the, the Archer community in the sense of the people who are actually on Archer um, via whatever grants they may have. So that is primarily um, what, what the funding is for. Um, Obviously, the more um, wider a UK scientific audience that, um, that this uh, helps, the better. But pr primarily, we're talking here about Archer. Um, so, so the Archer by Archer community, we simply mean people people working on Archer. Okay, is that okay, George? Okay, thanks. Um, so, also. Um, if PI and COI are from different institutions and software developer is employed by institution of the PI, does the COI get any overheads at all? Um, so the answer is no. Um, basically, it, it is own, the only money that, that the only funding that is paid is to support the technical staff. Um, so um, if the COI is at a different institution, then no, they would not get anything. And we, do, we, don't, act, we don't fund um, anything for the PI directly, it's important to say. It's only basically we fund the, uh, the associated, well, well, the technical staff gets paid um, according to the FEC model, um, which includes direct and indirect costs, but it doesn't include um, money for PI or anything like that. Um, yeah, and, and there's also travel. Um, we pay uh, um, for travel as well um, for the for the technical staff. Yeah, but on, only for the technical staff. So uh, to answer your question, you said you seem the COI gets some travel funds at most. So no, they they don't. No, the P, the COI and the PI do not get travel funds. It's only um, the technical staff. There, there really isn't that much travel funding available. Um, it's just it's just really for the technical staff to go and meet with the COI and PI. Um, if they're at um, a, di a, a different institution, or um, in some cases, if um, if there's any training that's needed, um, but that's all. Okay, so um, yes, certainly. Uh, if there's a, so there's a technical problem with the Wi-Fi. Um, that's fine. Yes, we can we can talk at the end, or we can. Um, if if you want, um, happy to either stay on or. Um, <coughs> oh, a summary. Sorry, could, could you have. Is it possible to have? Um, so we are recording the whole session, so um, we can give you access to the recording. I think that's that's probably the best thing. Um, but, I, but also, as I say, if you if you want to um, have a, another chat via via phone or anything like that or email, then that's also possible as well. Um, yes, I'd actually forgotten we were recording. <laughs> the the one thing to say is I don't think we have access to people's emails easily. Yes. So, so we'll not be able to directly send it to you unless you tell us who you are. Yes. So you'll have to basically, um, if you want to see a recording of the session, please, um, well, uh, so somebody asked, would you post it on YouTube? If you look at the Archer website, you'll find um, links from there. Um, it will be up in due course. Um, I'll, I'll, we'll try and get that put up as quickly as we can. Um, but um, as Lorna was just saying, we don't, uh, in, in, we don't, in all cases, know who you are um, from your 
from your usernames. Um, and obviously, some, some people will have registered via the, uh, our website when you joined, but um, we won't always have all of your emails, so we won't be able to necessarily contact you to tell you when the, the recording is up. So please keep an eye on the website um, uh, via, the, uh, via the training um, section and the, the virtual tutorial section, and we will put a recording up there so you can go back and, and have a look. Um, but uh, please do um, get, get in touch if you have any further questions and say just contact the Archer Help Desk and we'll answer as quickly as we can. Um, and all the queries there are logged so, so nothing gets forgotten or, or left. Um, yeah, we will answer. Okay, so somebody's asking how technical should be the proposal. Well, um, yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one. I mean, it has to be there has to be enough technical information that when the reviewers look through it, they um, can see what it is that you're trying to do, what it is need, needs doing, um, and show that you you basically you understand what needs doing, and enough that we can look at um, and and check it, that it all fits in with um, the work plan that you've given. Um, on the other hand, of course, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be so technical that you need to have, um, and you need to be an absolute expert in the field to, um, uh, you know, to follow exactly what it is that's going on. So it's a question of getting a balance, but I mean, it needs to have enough technical information in it so that um, it, can be, uh, it can be checked. Yes, and one of the one of the things that's quite important is that you you do show um, evidence of how your code scales and how your code performs um, on the system, so that you know we know what it is that you're um, that it is that you're, you're wanting to you know what what the improvements should actually do to the code, um, and show evidence of of why you think um, if, if it's for example if you were um, adding. If you were to try to improve the performance of a code, you know you need to show evidence of profiling to show that um, that uh, attacking a particular part of the code will actually be beneficial. Um, so does that answer your question? And one of the things I should note is that um, if if you complete your proposal in good time and you want us to have a quick look through it. Um, before you submit it, then please do do that. Um, uh, obviously, the closer to the deadline it gets, the harder it is for us to, to get through them all. But you know, if you do want to send it to us in advance, that would be really good, and then we can we can have a look. Um, I mean, we can only offer a guidance. Obviously, we we don't we don't do the, the final reviewing, but we can have a look to see if there's enough technical information for us to follow what's what's going on, and to check that we're not being uh, you know, not sort of blinding us with science, but just. Um, yeah, so do feel free to send us send it to us in advance. Um, that, that has been quite beneficial in the past. So um, yes, you can certainly send it to us to get to get feedback, um, and we will we will do what we can. As I said, the earlier you get it to us, the better. Um, and uh, but we will we will do what we can. Um, so, oh, sorry. So to sorry, I'm trying to skim read your question too quickly. Send if you send it to the Archer help desk. Yeah, that's the place to get it, to send it to. Okay, thanks. I'm glad you found it uh, useful. Okay, so um, does anybody have any final questions in the last uh, minute or so? Um, and you know, I'll just repeat what I say. If you if you do do feel free to send things into the Archer help desk, um, and we will we'll respond as quickly as we can. Um, Okay, so it's about a minute to twelve. So I'll, um, if there are no questions, I'll close it when it gets to, to twelve. But do uh, just type in if you have any last-minute questions. Okay, so I'll, I'll close the session down now. Um, but as I say a, a recording will be made available on the Archer website. So please look out for that. We'll get it up as soon as we can. And um, do just get in touch if you have any questions. Um, so thank you all for coming. Bye.